and welcome to another edition of Resistance TV. After the Corbyn project was raised to the ground inside the Labour Party, the need for an alternative political vehicle is essential. Various alternative political parties have been established. Some are new and others have been around for many years. Some have come and gone, of course. And the problem is the electoral system in this country seems to favour, or not seems to, it absolutely does favour a two-party system. But Labour and the Tories are fundamentally the same. I mean, the sort of two sides of the same coin, you might say. And the truth is, there isn't a huge difference between any of the parties who've taken their seats in Westminster. They're all enthralled to neoliberal economics. And of course, it's neoliberal economics that's driven the exponential growth in poverty and inequality ever since Dennis Healy went to the IMF in 1976 on a false premise. Even when Jeremy Corbyn was in the ascendancy inside the Labour Party, John McDonnell's economic agenda was still being boxed in by neoliberal orthodoxy. His fiscal credibility rule was just one of a number of examples of this muddled and dysfunctional economic thinking. Corbynomics offered some hope that Labour would break out of the neoliberal straitjacket, but after the 2015 leadership election, Corbynomics was quietly dropped. And on foreign policy, there's hardly a cigarette paper between any of the Westminster parties, particularly when it comes to backing NATO and war. So the question we're asking tonight is, does the Socialist Labour Party offer a credible way ahead? The Resist, Resist Movement's membership certainly seems to think so, because 89% of them voted to join the SLP in a ballot of members last year. So on tonight's programme to discuss this topic, I'm joined by the Socialist Labour Party Treasurer and former Vice President of the Yorkshire NUM, Ken Capstick, former Claycross Rent Rebel, County Councillor, National Union of Mine Workers activist and panellist on Crispin Flintoff's Sunday morning podcast, John Dunn, and the former National Organiser for Resist and Trade Union activist, Sean Bloor. Ken, let me start with you. The, the working class is finding its industrial voice again, isn't it? But there's no political vehicle for it in Westminster, is there? Is Ken there? We've got here, Ken, you might need to unmute. We seem to have lost Ken. Let me ask uh, Sean then while we see if we can get hold of uh, Ken that, that, that uh, same question. Sean, what, what, what do you think uh, about that then? Oh, I mean, Ken, Ken's uh, unmuted now. Ah, right, yeah. Ken. Yeah. Did, did you catch that question, Ken, what I was saying? Yes. Well, he, what, yeah, yeah. Yes. What's your thoughts? I think, I think that it's, um, it's encouraging that we are seeing uh, industrial action in this country again. On, on quite a scale. We haven't seen it for many years. Uh, the trade union movement has not been uh, t taking action for best part of 30 years. Uh, and people were beginning to think that the trade union movement was a buster clutch. Uh, this recent uh, situation where uh, quite a lot of unions are taking action at the same time uh, is very encouraging because uh, we're going through a situation where uh, inflation uh, RPI is running very high at around about 14% uh, and uh, that's really hitting the wages of working class people right across the board. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is definitely the effects we've had from COVID-19. But another major effect of the inflation that we see is the war taking place in Ukraine. And I believe it's a war that was brought about not by Russia, uh, but by the West, uh, with a determination to push right on to the borders of Russia, uh, surround Russia as best they can, and they've already got quite a lot of uh, uh, countries, NATO countries, on Russia's borders. And that, in my view, is an existential threat to Russia. And that's how Russia saw the situation in Ukraine. And uh, 
have taken action on that. I think that it could have been sorted before the war began, but now we're in a situation where I, I cannot I cannot see a way out of the war as it stands at the moment, and that is causing. We we know that the uh, the gas prices and uh, the oil prices have gone through the roof. Uh, unfortunately, the the pipelines from Russia to Germany have been blown up. Uh, the West is having to strut around all over the world for uh, for gas supplies and for oil supplies, uh, given that Russia's pretty much out of the game. And all that is leading to massive inflation. And, uh, and that is leading to people's uh, living standards uh, dropping through the floor. Uh, and to think that you have inflation, RPI inflation, which is the one I usually think about, uh, when you have that inflation running at 14%, and they are offering to uh, the RMT rail workers 4% this year and 4% next year. Uh, it's absolutely pathetic. What they're asking working class people to do is to take a massive uh, cut in their living standards. Uh, and uh, they will feel that, of course, in the supermarkets. They'll feel it in every walk of life because if you're if you're going to increase uh, gas prices and uh, oil prices to the extent that they are being increased right now uh, energy prices then the knock-on effect of that means that uh, <coughs> ordinary working people are going to really suffer uh, in, in terms of their living standards and what we are seeing is a fight back and that fight back that's taking place is very encouraging. It isn't the same as, in my view, as the fight backs we had in the 70s and 80s when a trade union would go on strike, an indefinite strike. What we are seeing is industrial action for a day or two days here and two days or three days there. I don't know what people think about that strategy. Uh, I think it has. I think it has problems, uh, but so did the strategy of going on strike indefinitely. So that. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. But the point is, though, uh, Ken. I mean, you know, the points that you've been making there very uh, eloquently. Um, there's no political outlet in Westminster. All the mainstream political parties are on board with supporting the ongoing proxy war in Ukraine, which is driving the cost of living catastrophe that you mentioned obviously fuel prices going through the roof is one feature of that but of course with the sanctions and so on it's also had a knock on effect in terms of uh, fertilizers and the rest because a lot of them come from from uh, from Russia as well so so there is a, so there's a, there's a whole host of uh, problems associated with these counterproductive uh, sanctions which are being uh, imposed mm -hmm. and the demands that are being made by working people and by the by the trade unions uh, it, it's, it's, well, the Labour Party is muted at best uh, and, and pretty hostile in, in, in some respects as well, uh, very much similar to the to the Tories. So just in terms of what we're talking about this evening, I mean, where is that political voice going to come from? And when one of the things I'm hoping is it could be the Socialist Labour Party, which has been around, obviously, now for, what, 26 years or so, uh, 27th year, isn't it, I think, this year? Yeah. Do you think... Uh, these the time has potentially come for the socialist labor party i mean it had a it had a a burst of of energy and and support when it when it first was established but lots of people like me ken we, we still believe that we could maybe turn the labor party you saw the light you know before we did um but we thought maybe the labor party could still be turned around we now know from we've seen what happened to to jeremy uh, the corbyn project that the labor party is totally busted flush yeah. So I, I can remember. Where does the SLP come in? Because there's a number of political parties that are mentioned. Uh, none of them have, you know, managed to cut through in the past. Can the SLP cut through in the future? Do you think? Well, I, I do think that we can. Uh, I remember a friend of mine who's 
currently a, a Labour MP, saying to me some years ago, before he became a Labour MP, that the Labour Party uh, was the only show in town. And that's why, that's why he was uh, a member of the Labour Party and eventually became a Labour MP because he thought the Labour Party was the only show in town. I think that that needs to change and I think it can change. Uh, and given the, the current situation, uh, we need to be uh, taking advantage of that and offering a home to people on the left because there, is not, there isn't a home to people on the left at the moment. The Labour Party certainly is not. And we, we, need, to, we need that kind of mobilisation. And it isn't, it's only, you know, a, a few years ago, maybe even during the miners' strike, when we could expect a number of Labour MPs supported by trade unions like the NUN and other unions to be getting up in Parliament and, uh, and arguing the case uh, for working class. That's gone. And it's gone because we do not have the big industries that we used to have. Uh, in, in the mining industry, people worked in the same place. Uh, the union was uh, on, the, on the site. Uh, they had immediate access to trade unionism in the mining industry and other industries as well. That doesn't seem to be the case as it was uh, before, before the deindustrialization of the country. So th th there was a massive deindustrialization took place. And with that, a lot of the strong uh, unions yeah. uh, disappeared uh, yeah. or became much weaker. But that's why I said at the beginning of this, my contribution, that I am heartened by the way that the trade union movement is responding because yeah. there, there are so many unions taking action now. I mean, we're even seeing the, uh, we're even seeing the lawyers, the QCs <laughs> taking action. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I am heartened by it. Uh, I think they've got a hell of a battle on their hands. But what they seem to lack, in my view, is, is a, a political guidance, a political uh, force with them. They, yeah. they, they naturally depended in the past on the Labour Party for that. Uh, you know, whether it was the miners or whether it was the steel workers or the dockers, uh, they, they could rely on a lot of support from the Labour Party. Yeah. Uh, now, there is no support whatsoever from the Labour Party. Uh, and so there needs to be a, a political uh, element to the struggles, yeah. that are ta struggles that are taking place. And that political element, I believe, could be and should be the Socialist Labour Party. Socialist Labour Party. Well, Sean, I mean, obviously you've been very involved from the outset before we moved over to join, that's the resist I'm referring to now, of course, before we had put the decision to join the SLP. Um, and you were obviously inspired, I think, by the whole Corbyn surge, uh, and, and that did inspire hundreds of thousands of, of people to join the Labour Party. I mean, one of the things we were saying when we established Resist is that those people, you know, haven't disappeared. Do you think that there's a potential that we can, in the SLP, be the vehicle for those people who obviously are disgruntled now with the Labour Party, and the Labour Party's lost about 200,000 members at least? Um, I mean, how do we go about that? I mean, what's your thoughts on that, Sean, in terms of uh, where, where have all those Corbyn supporters gone and that could be a song, couldn't it? You know, where have all the Corbyn supporters gone? Was it <laughs> Peter and Mary? You know? Yeah, I mean, they're still there, aren't they? Um, everybody's still there. I think a lot of people have been scared by what's happened during the Corbyn era with all the anti-Semitism smears. Um, a lot of people were personally affected 
by those allegations and smears. Um, but I think, you know, now is the time we can rebuild a real socialist uh, movement um, and political party through the Socialist Labour Party. They've, they're well respected. They've been around since 1995, is it, Ken? Um, yeah. It, under the leadership of Arthur Scargill, um, who is, well, he's still the king of the trade trade union movement. Um, but we need to get these trade unions on board with us. Um, yesterday was uh, was great. I saw the tr all the trade unionist <clears throat> leaders coming out of the uh, government buildings after they'd had their meetings. That, you know, uh, that there was the rail workers, there was the uh, the postal workers, the paramedics union, the nurses union, and the teachers union uh, as well, because they're currently balloting for strike action. So it was great to see all these trade unions, um, you know, getting together. But you know. What is the answer to it all? Um, the answer, you know, it could be, uh, it's, is it time for a general strike? I know a lot of people have been calling for that over the last couple of years uh, to try and bring this uh, government back down to earth. Um, but, you know, we're, we're clearly being led by uh, a Tory government who, as always, are sticking to the guns and just um, pandering to the capitalists uh, you know, to, to the corporate corporations. Um, and, uh, you know, they need to remember that when you put money in working class pockets, that is when the economy will recover. Uh, so, for example, all these uh, handouts have been given to people for uh, to help with fuel bills. Um, you know, that's not been given to the people because that's going, it might be going into your bank account, but it's going straight back out to the uh to the corporations um the yeah. yeah to the utilities and these big corporations so it's going back into their shareholders uh and into their profits um you know w we need to stop that um you know you give you give a working class person 100 quid to spend they'll they'll spend it in their local town center or in their local village their local shop um, which you know helps to to boost the local economy and, and to keep small businesses running. Um, just been having a conversation with somebody in chat who runs a small business and they're really suffering. I, I know the small businesses in in our village are really suffering, and there's a number of shops that are going to end up having to close down, which will hurt our little community. Yeah. Um, so we need to start organising. We need to start organise organising on um, on a much lar larger scale. Now we've got a political vehicle uh, to move um, our socialist agenda forward. Um, people should be joining in the droves. Um, we can do this. We really can do this. We've got two parties in power. We've got a two-party state, um, the Labour Party, the Tory party. There's not a fag paper between them, um, let's face it. Um, the Labour Party have been, just been dragged further and further to the right over the last decade uh, or so. And uh, it's time for uh, a rational left party to regain power. It's time for the, for the unions to, um, to realise you know, where their um, loyalties lie. Um, and it doesn't lie with the Labour Party anymore. Um, you know, you were saying, Sean, about uh, people ought to be joining in, in droves. I, I mean, I, I certainly agree with, with that. It is, I think maybe part of the problem is the kind of visibility. Funnily enough, I was talking, we were just chatting before we went on air. I was talking to, to an, um, a prominent activist uh, yesterday and uh, she was... Uh, very supportive of the Corbyn project, you know, very supportive of the positions that the SLP has taken on a range of different topics, although she wasn't aware of the Socialist Labour Party. And as we've said on this programme before, where we referred to the last Labour Party conference, there was a banner outside saying what we need is a Socialist Labour Party. And I don't think they necessarily realised the Socialist Labour Party is here, mate. It, it, yeah, it already yeah. is in existence. So. What yeah. do you think can be done to kind of raise that visibility? Visibility, because one of the things that will work against us certainly is the is the corporate media won't give us any oxygen. Um, we know that we're also being um, suppressed on social media. My, for example, number of followers that I get are are, uh, are being reduced. I mean, they they have shadow banned me. Um, 
the Socialist Labour Party's number of followers again, similarly, I think, is, is on social media has is, is, is not been accelerating as much as it perhaps could not ought to be. So what else can we do, do you think, to overcome that? Because social media is a useful tool. Um, it's a tool, it's but it's, 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 not the pan, it's not the panacea. We've got to get back out on the streets, haven't we? Um, we've got to get back out doing street stalls, leafleting, um, you know, pounding the beat as we used to do, knocking on doors, telling people that we're here um, and this is what we want for people. Um, and also listening to people. Uh, you know, that was one of the things when I used to get a uh, knock on doors with the Labour Party. They weren't interested in listening to people. No, they just wanted no. to know if you were, if they were going to get the vote or not. Um, you know, I used to get told off by um, by people saying, oh, you're spending too much I time did. talking to I people did. on the doorstep. Hurry up. Uh, we only yeah, want to know, know if we get the vote. And, you know, yeah. that's all they care about. They don't care about the, no. the people. They just want to know they've got the vote. And, um, you know, we need a we need a party out there who's going to knock on doors, talk to people, have a conversation, listen to what their problems and issues yeah. are and uh, and come up with a, um, you know, a practical um, and good plan um, for the the direction this country needs to go in and we need to be spreading that message and I think now we've come together um, we've got resist and we've got the Socialist Labour Party um, you know we've um, more than doubled our numbers overnight um, there's many more thousands of people out there um, that that should be joining us and um, I would encourage them to do so. Let's get back out there. Let's get back out on the streets. Let's get back out doing our street stalls and leafleting and, and talking to people. Can yeah, I... I can certainly empathise with that with that cynicism that you are, that you mentioned there, Sean. Because I know I remember a conversation with a with a, a prominent local Labour you know, aficionado in 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 Derby. And we were talking about a particular part of the city where the a very working class uh, area, a very poor area actually, uh, where the turnout was very low. They always returned a Labour, a Labour member, but the turnout was kind of down to 20% or something. And and his view was, well, that doesn't matter really because you know they're voting for us. It doesn't really matter about the other 80%. And similarly, when I spoke, I remember talking to Tom Harris in the House of Commons because I was saying, oh, he's a right wing new Labour. He lost his seat in. Uh, in the SNP surge in 2015, but I remember saying to him, "Look, what we we should be giving people a reason to vote. You know, we need to be uh, inspiring the non-voters." And he kind of metaphorically patted me on the head and said, "Oh, you don't understand, Chris. The, the point about non-voters is that they don't vote, so don't bother wasting your time on them." I just want to bring you back in, Ken. I just want to yes. go to to John yeah. because John, yeah. you know, I've not heard from, okay. from John yet, and I just wanted to just pick up on one of the points that you made uh, in your contribution, Ken, and and, and get. Uh, John's view on it in relation to the way in which the trade unions seem to still, many of them are still affiliated, but still seem to look to the to the Labour Party, seem to look to the Labour Party for a lead, even though that lead isn't being provided. We've seen Sir Keir Starmer telling front benches not to go and stand on, on picket lines, they're confirming that they're not going to repeal the anti-trade union legislation. They're saying that if a Labour government comes into office, we're not going to be getting the checkbook out. We can't spend our way out of this. You can actually spend your bloody way out of it. It's all about political will in the end. I mean, it's been done and should have gone a lot further, actually. I know we talk about the 1945 Labour government as if it was, uh, you know, the panacea. It wasn't. I mean, it should have done a lot more than it did, but it did do some great things when the country was broke and actually when it was still um, you know, linked to the US dollar on the Bretton Woods system. So there was a kind of gold standard of sorts. We're not in that situation now. There's a lot more flexibility available for a government like like uh, like Britain. Uh, and this is why the problem when I was mentioning about Gordon Brown going to the uh, IMF in 1976 on a false premise that the country was running out of money, which is impossible when you, when you, uh, you know, you issue your own currency. But just this point, John, about the trade unions, what... what what have we got to do to wean the trade unions away from the Labour Party? It's like a, it's like a kind of um, an abusive relationship, isn't it? Seems it's, to me, it's it is, more anyway. than that. Uh, it's it's abusive, and people are being conned out of hard-working funds that goes via political levy to the Labour Party. 
And I think the problem you've got is uh, people see it at the moment as the only alternative after 13 years of horrendous cuts and attacks and that Labour might be a little bit better. I think those illusions will be shattered after a, a Starmeroid uh, government. But I think the first steps we need to do is start arguing for disaffiliation. I think yeah. this, uh, some unions have already uh, made moves in that direction. The Baker's Union in particular have disaffiliated. Yeah, well, they yeah, After yeah. Ian Hodgson, the, you know, their fantastic president was yeah. uh, suspended and expelled uh, from the party. I like to say the party formerly known as Labour, because we've yeah. in, in, in effect, we've got a national government in everything we are, but we name. Are, yeah. And I think the election of Sharon Graham has been a landmark that she's already cut from... Unite, General Secretary. Yeah, and I'm so pleased I campaigned for yes. her. And I got lots of abuse uh, mm. for doing so, but I knew she she was the one. She's already cut the funding nationally. She yeah. expelled the Coventry councillors who, who uh, were attacking their own workforce. And yeah, I think the pressure, right. particularly in Unite, needs to be kept up. Uh, and, you know, forget this, they might be slightly better. We, You know, we only have to, to look back to the Blair government and people say, oh, well, you know, we got Shaw Star, we got new hospitals. But look at the cost of, of those oh, yeah. new hospitals right. now in terms of PFI as a burden on the the health service. And, you know, a few little fripperies like that can't compensate for a million Iraqi deaths, the failure to regulate the banks that ruined the economy that we're still paying the price of. So I, th I think that has to be key on the agenda. But also to do that, I think, you know, the profile, the things that Sean was saying about being seen, being visible, I can't remember when I last said a loudspeaker during an election campaign. You know, you stand on the end of a street, speak for five minutes, and the whole street's out listening. And you capture some imaginations then, you know. It's not a matter of knocking on doors and saying, who are you going to vote for? I remember the 2017 election. How, how magnificent that was. I worked in four constituencies. I came yeah. down for yourself in the morning. I went yeah. back to my own in, uh, in North East Derbyshire. I called off in, uh, in Rotherham. And then I came back to my own in Calder Valley. And I remember knocking on a row of terraced houses, obviously a very poor area. And we got this ridiculous board with who to knock. Uh, uh, one door in about a hundred houses. So I said, why don't we knock them all while we're here? Oh no, we, on, we only knock where we know we've got Labour voters, which, go back, which goes back to the point you were making about, you know, the people who don't vote, why don't they vote? Uh, up until Corbynism, turnouts at elections, general elections were falling massively. Blair Lott and Brown lost five million votes over the course of a government. And I think we have to revitalise political campaigning, but also part of community campaigning as well. It's no, ju ju no good just turning up the week before an election and saying, hello, we've descended from the heavens again. We're here uh, to, to, to listen to you. We, we've got to fight, you know, we've got to politicise food banks. We've got to, you know, if energy uh, banks are being set up where people go for a war, we've got to be in there agitating. You know, we've, we've got to be seeing the old fashioned methods, if you like, and not rely too much on, uh, on social media. And I think if we start doing that, it's not going to be easy. You have to start somewhere. Uh, and I think that the telling point will be perhaps in the first year if yeah. if her Stam and Fiora uh, does get the keys to number yeah. 10, which I find highly doubtful. 
mobilise that grassroots. That was the failure of Corbyn. Yeah. He had 600,000 people, 300,000 who joined on the back of all those fantastic public rallies, the, the great broadcast that Ken Loach was doing for the Labour Party. Well, then it degenerated back into parliamentary game. And yeah. I watched Parliament today, and there was a... Uh, oh, mainly you have a stronger well, constitution than me, mate. I couldn't really watch well, it. Well, <laughs> I like that, you know, uh, I can't shout at Beverly, so I shout at the telly. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, PMQs, and, and, and it was... And, uh, uh, it was raised about funding of private schools and the tax relief they got. And uh, and Sunak's response was, well, if, it, if that was good, the previous Labour government would have done it, and they didn't. No. no well, we no. know why they didn't. They were capping yeah. hand to, to yeah. liberalism. But I think we yeah. have to remain optimistic. The things that... that uh, you, Sean, and Ken have said about the awakening of industrial action. It's got tremendous weaknesses, and it's not being backed up by public no. rallies in many places. Uh, you know, just out in streets giving leaflets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's a sign, and if we can get people mobilised in communities, and let's yeah. be honest, people have got their chins on their chest. They're suffering. They're yeah. doing the best to hold body and soul together. And we have to offer them an alternative, a real alternative. And I think the Socialist Labour Party, which I've always kept in touch with, I was, like you, naive enough, perhaps not to think we could change uh, Labour, but uh, that it was a vehicle to work in for change. Yeah. It took, you know, 51 years. Uh, and then... Uh, the, uh, as I say, the party formerly known as Labour expelled me. Yeah. And, you know, they're so efficient, they expelled me a year after I'd left. That's pathetic, so, I know. That's, well, that's I like that name, name uh, John, uh, party formerly known as Labour. I think that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a great uh, tagline. We should start start using that, I think. I'll start, might start, you might start seeing my, my social media posts from that. So, but, you know, I have no thanks. copyright on it. <laughs> I was going to say, mate, free. about that. I was going to say about that. But just on, on that point, before I come back to Ken, um, and about inspiring uh, people, and maybe one of the places to to start trying to make inroads, obviously we've got to raise political consciousness before you can even start making inroads in, in local government, but if we can start getting some footholds in, in local government, uh, and, and particularly if, you know, if the SLP could you know, take control of, of some authorities, there are powers available to local authorities right now, actually, one of the things I was banging on about trying to get Labour groups to use the powers at their disposal when I was still an MP to stop. In fact, that was why I stepped down from the front bench, because the, the local government front bench in Westminster was, was up in arms about what I was suggesting that the Labour party, the Labour councils could do to stop the Tory cuts to, to address the housing crisis. And just before I come back to Ken, I wonder whether, uh, John, you could say a bit about your time in local government, you know, going right back to the to the to the Claycross rent rebels. I mean, and you know what they did. And there's a fantastic documentary. I've mentioned this on the program before, and I'm sure you've seen it, John. Um, but uh, Austin Mitchell, when he was still working uh, for uh, Yorkshire TV, I think it was, uh, they did a little documentary about the Claycross controversy. But what was inspiring about it? It's still available on on you on uh, YouTube now, or it was anyway. If you just sort of Google Claycross rent rebels. Um, Austin Mitchell, it'll, it'll come up, I think. Um, but what was fantastic was all the other, not just about taking on the Tory government to say, we're not going to impose these, I think they referred to it as fair rents, didn't they? Fair rents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, fair rents. And we're going to put your rent, it's fair, but we're going to put your rents up massively. And you resisted that in Clade Cross and obviously paid the price for it. You might want to say a bit about that. But it was all the other, 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 other all the other innovative stuff that you were doing in Clade Cross. Clay Cross, for those watching who didn't know this, were providing free TV licenses to pensioners 20 years before it became, you know, government policy. One of the decent things, I suppose, that the Labour government under, under Blair did. But this is what local government was doing. What I have always felt you should do when you have a political uh, platform and what, what Claycross did and what a lot of local Labour local authorities did 
It's they implemented municipal socialism. They used the powers at their disposal to make a difference. I was wondering whether, John, you could just say a little bit about that and, and whether there's scope to, you know, do stuff like that again. I think there government. is. And I think what has to be said is that uh, way before the battles against the Housing Finance Act started, Claycross went on a period of uh, slum clearance uh, they rehoused people out of slums into communities with the same, same, if you wanted to live next door to the same person, you both moved together. They kept yeah. that community together. They built lovely council houses, provided cookers and things like that uh, yeah. inside. And that was a, a massive success because you know, yeah. you've got rows and rows of uh, ex-industrial housing, outside toilets, no warm water, and a massive clearance uh, got rid of that and created vibrant communities with communal spaces and yeah. things like that. We had a 24-7 a warden system yeah, uh, in, in specially built uh, little uh, bungalow estates, sheltered accommodation, as it's now called now, and one of the things that I got surcharged was paying people who administered care to elderly and disabled a living wage. They decided yeah. that we'd broken the uh, the pay restraint and added that on to uh, other surcharges. But other things, when Thatcher, before she uh, uh, became PM, was known as the milk snatcher. She milk snatcher, free yeah. School meal, yeah. Free school milk. We yeah. provided that out of the chairman's allowance. I remember that was in the, that's, that's in the documentary, John. And buying yeah. fancy robes and chains. In fact, the yeah. chairman never wore uh, the yeah. medallion it was then. But they used that allowance to reinstate yeah. it in all schools through Clay Cross. Yeah. And obviously, you know, we had a first class repairs. It's hard to believe when you look at the state. Uh, of yeah. uh, municipal housing, what's left of it now. And of course, we kept rents low. Rent yeah. was subsidised by the rate fund. Kind yeah. of backlash from people who were owner occupiers. But at that time, they got tax relief on mortgages. Oh, yeah, of course. It was mortgage interest relief. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That out. And, and the average rent in Clay Cross uh, in the 70s was as that as it seems today around two pound a week. Yeah. So when the government said you've got to put another pound on, that was a massive increase. 50%. And yeah. today councils say, oh, we can't resist cuts or they'll send commissioners in and they'll implement them. Well, his government sent a housing commissioner into Clay Cross mm. to collect the rents we refused to give him a room in the town hall. We chased him out of Clay Cross, actually. Yeah. And he had to take up residence in the Chesterfield Hotel, uh, six miles away. Yeah. Uh, his name was Patrick Skillington. He came from a place, Henley on Thames. I don't know how similar that was to Clay Cross. <laughs> not, not very similar. <laughs> when I doubt it. Uh, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> he never collected a penny. No. They increased rents. The only time they got those increased rents was when uh, Claycross dissolved into the greater council known as North East Derbyshire. Yeah, so that was the local government reforms at Ted Heath. That, that time, was, yeah. Yeah. was led by a character called Bob Cochran, who was one of the uh, founder members of the Social Democratic Alliance that uh, later uh, became yeah, the yeah. Social Democratic uh, yeah. Party and help destroy uh, yeah. uh, that uh, potential Michael Foot. Uh, yes, indeed, with it, with it, with it, with it, with so, it. Uh, you know, we've got a proud could... record, and you can't yeah. be yeah. commissioners. You don't have to worry. Well, you can't. I mean, and, and I think what you demonstrated, John, was, uh, you know, in Clay Cross, and there were other examples of Labour authorities, and when David Bookbinder was the leader of Derbyshire County mm -hmm. Council, you know, they, they showed leadership and uh, mm -hmm. used the platform to make a difference for people. And the point is that Labour authority, well, not just Labour, well, let's, let's discard the, the, the party formerly known as Labour. They're, they're a waste of space. They're never going to do anything in local government. But local authorities have the powers now. You don't even have to go yeah. out on a limb in the way in which you did 
showing the political leadership that you did at that time. Labour authorities, all local authorities, have powers at their disposal right now to stick within the law and still stop the Tory cuts and ask the rich people to pay a lot more. They could, they've got the powers right now to eliminate the housing mm -hmm. crisis. There's no cap on the housing any cap. They're not doing it. But Ken, I just want to come back to you. I know you wanted to say something, but I want to also ask you about um, the, this Enough is Enough um, uh, campaign. I mean, and that certainly captured the imagination. I guess a lot of the disgruntled Corbynites have, uh, have rallied to, to that cause. I'm not sure where they're going, though, ultimately, when they get towards a general election, what's going to be the advice, if any, about how people should vote. I'd hope they'd come out and say, vote for the Socialist Labour Party. But... Um, I wonder whether that might be a, a fertile um, recruiting uh, place, picking up on the point that John and, uh, and Sean were making, where, you know, if we could maybe get some of our activists to go along there with some leaders. This might say, well, look, we'll join the Socialist Labour Party. We yeah. can be the voice, you know, the political vehicle for the dis disenchantment, the, the anger, which has been articulated through the Enough is Enough campaign. I think the Enough is Enough has been good in gathering people together but what's the next step and what do we do, as I say, in the next election? What's your thoughts on that, Ken? Well, uh, I mean, I agree that we've got to, to do that, uh, but we've got to recognise where we are at at the moment. Um, I can remember speaking in a, a place called Glossop in, 19, oh, yeah. in, 19, in 1984, yeah. when, I, when I was 43 years of age. And I remember speaking with a young man called John Dunn. And, uh, <laughs> and he, he was a young man. Uh, and, so, yeah. and so was I. Yeah. And this is what we need to be breathing into the Socialist Labour Party. The Socialist Labour Party, I joined it in 1996. I was 55. And so since, since then... You know, a lot of water has gone under the bridge. And we, we ended up in 1997 with a massive Labour majority. It enthused a lot of people. And that made, that made life difficult in many ways for the Socialist Labour Party because people were so enthused by Tony Blair. And we all know what happened. Yes. Uh, and the way, that in, in which the, way the, the Labour Party went. And people were very much misled by that. But nevertheless, it did have an effect. And then, uh, you know, we, we've had the Corbyn effect. And Corbyn was unable to change the Labour Party. And I knew that. Uh, and when a, a, quite a, a few people uh, who were who are our comrades still they left the they left the socialist labor party and jumped to the labor party because they thought that the corbyn revolution was going to change everything and, and of course it didn't and so what we are left with that we have to recognize is that we have a, an aging party and we need to get to the young, younger people. We need to bring younger people into the party. We need to get young people on platforms speaking, people who've never spoke before. We need to, if we, if we have a platform, we need to be getting young people on it as well, uh, you know, as old buggers like me. Uh, and we need to be enthusing, you know, enthusing young people because the party... A party can die of old age, and uh, if we don't, you know, we'll, the people that I meet with now in the Socialist Labour Party, I've been meeting with them for years, mm. and we need we need young blood, uh, young blood to enthuse the party, but we need to bring young people on. There are, you know, we're not we're not the only public speakers. There are young people who are aching to get out there and, and get onto platforms and speak and get the experience of public speaking. By the time they've done five or six meetings, John will tell you, by the time they've done five or six meetings, they start to get uh, good at it and then they improve and improve. When we've got to bring young people 
into this party and so we've got to encourage them to come so we we'll, in my view we need a youth section and we need to encourage uh, a, a, an active youth section and we need to make sure that if we're having meetings like i'm going to be speaking in swaddling coat we need to make sure that we've got someone from the youth section on the platform speaking as well uh, yeah. and and bit you know yes nice to get into local government of course it would be nice to win an election like that and get people into local government we mustn't ever think that we give up on that but i think it's far far more important at the moment that we make ourselves into a young party uh and that that's what will encourage young people to come and join us if they see other young people and yes look, indeed and, and it's the visibility, Ken, isn't it? It's, it's kind of raising the visibility, I suppose, of the SLP. So if people know that the Socialist Labour Party exists, uh, you know, given its very strong commitment to socialism, its, uh, its unambiguous commitment to, you know, overhauling capitalism, uh, its anti-imperialist stance as well, I think that a lot of people would be attracted by those fundamental underlying principles of the Socialist Labour Party. The key thing is, is actually you know getting that in front of of people and uh, it comes back to, to sean's point really i suppose about you know how do we do that getting out there and you know and fight you know going to those places where you know where people are congregating and simple things really again john was making this point as well you know the old-fashioned way i mean obviously social media is important we should also use that to the nth degree absolutely but actually, no substitute for going out and you know putting something in somebody's hand and having a conversation with them. You know, at places like you know, enough is enough gatherings and things like that. You know, uh, hopefully we can. Well, we can I'm, to build this up. I'm hoping to get my speech in uh, Rosley uh, videoed. Right, uh, a decent video as well. Not yeah, you know, so but to get it videoed and to get that out there as well. I think we need yeah. to. I think we need to get our activities out there so that people can see what's going on. Rather, you know, I mean, uh, I went. I've been a few times to Swaddling Coke to meetings, and they've yeah. been they've been good meetings, probably with fifty people there. Yeah, but th they are the only fifty people who knew about it. We've yeah, got... so it's getting getting a message out there. I mean, social media can help with that, though, Ken, of course. And let's not underestimate social media. It can be very good at that. Um, I mean, that's one of the ways in which in the 2017 election that John was talking about, bearing in mind that the Labour Party bureaucracy was seeking to sabotage the election, um, but activists were using social media, and that's what actually was mobilising people. You know, in my constituency in Derby North, we were inundated with activists. And on a few occasions, the agent said to me, it was a bit like the Battle of Britain, but every bloody plane was up, you know, there's nothing left. He said, shit, if anybody else comes, we've got literally nothing left, literally nothing. There were no leaflets, no clipboards, no canvas sheets. Going. We had nothing. I mean, you know, so we, anybody else had joined, we'd have to go send it with a new, we had about, you know, up to 15, 20 teams of canvases out. It's unbelievable, you know, so that's the type of thing that we need to be to doing. Listen, we're running out of, uh, of time, and I want to get just some final thoughts from, from each of you, but just before we do that, I do want to go back to you, Sean, and ask you about, obviously we've thrown our lot in with the Socialist Labour Party, and I mentioned in the op my opening remarks that there are a number of other alternative political parties out there, some of which have joined uh, sorry, some of which have been established, you know, quite recently, some of which have been a bit, you know, unwilling to working in collaboration. I mean, what, what's your thoughts about some of these new, newer political parties? I mean, the People's Alliance, I think they call themselves of, of the uh, left, and that uh, includes, you know, new, newer, newish political parties that have been established since the 2019 general election. I mean, is it worth seeking to try and recruit some of them and say, look, you know, come and join us. We've got the Socialist Labour Party. The name is very important, I think. You know, Labour people can associate with that, you know, because political, you know, political awareness is, is, is quite low, isn't it? And people see, you know, well, Labour as a kind of alternative that's or even though they're bloody crap, as we know. But it's that familiarity. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, if people could kind of come in with us, we've got a much better chance, I think, of making, being able to cut through. So, do you think we should be seeking to 
caught some of those new members of those new political parties and say, look, you know, come with us, or, or what do we do? Or do we just go off on our own and, and just try and seek new, get new people in? What's your thoughts on that point? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one because, um, yes, there's, there's new parties that have sprung up over the last couple of years and um, they've come together in this PAL alliance. But then they've also proven that they are they don't want to work with other people. Um, so, you know, it's unless unless we can come to an agreement where all these parties can work together in, in a in a real socialist coalition, um, then it's not going to happen. Uh, people are going to have to make their own minds up. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't see any reason why we can't leave the door open and say, come and join us. Um, but, um, you know, the, the response we got when we were in resist um, from from PAL was, um, you know, and, and the Workers' Party, they didn't want the Workers' Party. They didn't want us. They didn't want Tusk. So, you know, why are people working with in in parties that won't work with other socialist parties? I think people need to look inwardly and reflect on, uh, you know, why are they why are they in these other parties who are refusing to work with the greater socialist uh, left uh, for the good of everybody? Um, I'd like people to take that away and think about that. Um, and uh, and come to their own conclusions, really. Um, but just going back to what Ken was saying about getting young blood, I mean, it was something that uh, I would I wanted to do this year. Uh, sorry, last year was get round the universities in September and October during Freshers' Weeks, um, and we we need to get teams out there um, leafleting um, and doing events at universities, uh, at campuses, and. Um, and round colleges, uh, leafleting colleges, and and uh, recruiting these younger people because it's the younger people that have these social who have real socialist values. You know, they. I think this this generation that's coming through now are so caring. Um, they're a really really caring um, sort of cohort of people. Um, you know, some people say, oh, you know, the, the youngsters or oh, they don't know what they're doing. But I think this this cohort of young people that we've got nowadays are wonderful young people. And, uh, you know, they don't want war um, they want peace. Um, they want to be, you know, they they're looking at the future and they're thinking, I'm never going to be able to afford a house. Um, mm. You know, are there enough jobs out there? Are there any decent jobs? I've got a huge student loan that I've got to pay off and uh, rent's too expensive. I can't afford to move out of my parents' house. And they've got all these worries on their shoulders at a very young age now. And, um, you know, I, I, I think... I think we've, we, you know, if we can get around the universities and the college campuses, um, I think we will, we will get a lot of youngsters involved in in this new, uh, in this new movement. Well, listen, we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, about, hang on, I mean, we've got about, about six or seven minutes left. So I just want to get some final thoughts uh, from from each of you. Whether you might also want to just comment on Ken Loach's idea that he talked about. You may have heard him. Uh, John on Crispin Flintoff's uh, Sunday morning show where he talked about people, a network of um, of uh, candidates around the country coming together as independent uh, Labour candidates, uh, you know, arguing on similar uh, policy proposition that was contained in the 2017 manifesto which was a good manifesto, but there's some parts of it which were, were crap. I mean, let's be honest about it. I mean, talk about trying for the rest of it. The problem with Ken's proposition is that you can't do it. You can't stand as an independent Labour candidate. At least you can't put that on your ballot paper because of rules that were brought in by new Labour. means that the only thing you can describe yourself on the ballot paper is either independent or if you're standing for a registered political party, and you have to stand for a registered political party with the Electoral Commission, you can then use that name, but you can't use anything else. And the problem with, as we found in Resist before we took the decision to join the Socialist Labour Party when there was a move to create uh, you know, a political party, you, you couldn't actually use a name that was similar to, or could be confused with, 
an existing political party. So you couldn't set up an alternative political party called, for example, the Independent Labour Party or anything like that. So that option isn't really available. And I contacted Ken and he wasn't aware of that and said, that's why I believe, because I'd spoken to Ken before about joining the Socialist Labour Party, the SLP offers us the best option on that front, doesn't it? Because it's got the name, you know. So but just some closing thoughts, uh, Ken, uh, on that maybe and anything else. And we, we've only about a minute because we've only we've got to get all of you and we've only got about the, uh, four minutes, five minutes left. So 60 seconds, well, Ken, in, close, in summary. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, look, I believe that we have to be careful uh, as to what we attract if we don't have a political party like the Socialist Labour Party that has a programme, uh, that has its principles. People know what they get uh, and what, what they see is what they get. You've got to be careful. We've had this situation before where we have uh, everybody and, ev and everyone who comes and joins a party that they have widely different views from the uh, ultra left right across to the what you well what you would call let's say the moderate left for a, 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 an explanation but uh, so you you really do have to be careful about having a political organization that's uh, that's got such a wide uh, a wide agenda uh, you need you need people to know what you stand for, who you are, and you've got to be careful about infiltration by people who have totally different views. Sean, any closing comments at all? Any concluding remarks? Sorry, Chris, you caught me a bit off guard there. I was twiddling my thumbs. Oh, sorry, right. yeah, <laughs> listening, yeah. I was listening to Ken. Um, yeah. yeah um, I th you know, like as like I said, um, we we've got to organise. We've got to organise in our communities. We've got to organise around colleges, universities. We've got to get out there onto the streets, talk to people, um, knock on doors, and actually be seen to be doing stuff within our communities because people have got a they've got a win. We've got to win back that trust. People don't trust politicians anymore. People don't trust. They, they've lost all that trust. They they don't believe that politicians reflect real life, and they don't. Let's face it. No. Um, so we've we, you know we've got a lot of trust to win back. Um, and I you know think we can do it. We can do this. Solidarity. Absolutely. We can do it. Absolutely, comrade. A rallying call from Sean. Then, and uh, John, the final word to you. Then, in the last minute or so. Um, as well, on the subject of, of newer, younger people, uh, I'm very fortunate. I spend a lot of my time now the Aubrey Truth and Justice campaign, speaking at all sorts of meetings, and they get a first factory, a younger activist. They're raw, they're not really educated, but I think, as Ken says, if you've got the programme, you'll win these people, and you'll educate them, and you'll train them to speak, to go out and campaign, and, uh, you know, we need to forget about many of the, the younger ones that got hijacked by momentum or Navara tedium, as I call it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's fresh blood out there. I see it in my meetings. Look at this picture behind me. Young kids, because yeah. of the leadership of Arthur Skagel, because of the message of the NUM, were prepared to shirtless, in, in shorts, in, in trainers, we're prepared to stand up to armed riot police. If we could mm. do it then, we can do it now. Do it now. Absolutely, comrade. Say before we yep. finish, it's Arthur Scargill's birthday today. And can oh, is it really? Many happy returns. Very, very many happy returns, Arthur. You've been an inspiration, mate, for, mm. well, all of my life. All my I, I, I can remember. So, absolutely, mate. And it's been a privilege to kind of be working with you, comrade. So, all the very best and very many happy returns if you're watching. Listen, let me thank uh, Ken Capstick, Sean Bloor and John Don. I think it's been a really interesting, fascinating uh, discussion this evening. Hopefully it's uh, piqued some people's uh, interest. And uh, if you're not already a member of the Socialist Labour Party, you know, <laughs> consider joining us and, and help us to you know, build this movement. It's desperately needed now. The Labour Party, as we've already said, totally busted flush. There is a massive need out there. If people are really struggling, people are really suffering. And it's only set to get 
even worse. And great to see the working class finding its industrial voice, as I was saying at the opening remarks, but we've got to provide that political voice as well. So thanks for watching this evening. Thanks again to uh, the guests on the show. And hopefully we'll see you next week at the same time, same place. On this is TV, seven o'clock next Wednesday. Thank you and good night.